I'll just tell you about um, my work done at Duke University in collaboration with radiologists. Uh, as you can notice, like uh, most of the cultures are MDs or radiology related people. Um, and so uh, this presentation is based on a publication that's published in radiology. And it was written for radiologists and with radiologists. Um, so if you want to know more details, I refer you to this publication. But in this presentation, I tell you more about machine learning perspective of, uh, of this study. And so first, I do a standard presentation uh, of our work. Uh, but then, in addition, I'll tell, more, tell you more about negative findings, things that are not published, things that we tried but uh, didn't work. Um, okay, so first, background. Um, so when I started working on this project, I didn't know what thyroid is. So it's a gland in the neck consisting of two lobes, and it can grow nodules inside. And it's estimated that it affects as much as 50% of the, of the population. It's more common in women. And actually, often people live with thyroid nodules. They don't know about it. Uh, their health or well-being is not affected. But in some cases, they can be dangerous. They can be malignant and actually pose some threat to you. And uh, tri triaging them for biopsy is based on assessment of ultrasound images by radiologists. But uh, the problem with that is that it suffers from high uh, interreader variability, meaning like different radiologists make uh, very different decisions depending on their, their personal view or just because. And sometimes they tend to overdiagnose, meaning they tend to send nodules to biopsy, even though it's not necessary because they think, well, let's check just in case. Uh, and because of that, the number of biopsies is growing, but we're not actually detecting any more cancers. Mm, and another problem with this uh, that is not uh, mentioned here is that there's a shortage of a very qualified uh, radiologist doing this interpretation. Uh, so radiologists came up with this system called thyroid imaging reporting and data system. Uh, so they came up with it to uh, reduce interreader variability. So usually radiologists just look at ultrasound images and they just decide, okay, it looks suspicious to me, let's send it to biopsy, or no, it doesn't look suspicious, let's don't biopsy it. Uh, so to reduce the interreader variability, uh, they came up with a system of five feature categories. And so what radiologists are doing or are supposed to do according to those guidelines is uh, assess a nodule in ultrasound images for all those five categories and decide whether any of those features is present in the image. Those features are basically visual features. Uh, radiologists are asked, is the nodule dark or bright? Is it wide? What's the margin? Is it irregular? Are there any lobulations or is it smooth? Stuff like that. So it's supposed to be very simple and then all features have a specific number of points associated with them. And then you sum up points across all categories. You get the total number of points. And the more points nodule gets, the more likely it is to be malignant. And then, based on the number of points, you decide whether it's benign, suspicious, or highly suspicious. And then, based on nodule size, you decide whether you send it to biopsy, do a follow-up study in, let's say, one year, half a year, or do nothing, because it's clearly benign. Um, 
but still there's a problem with this uh, system, and it's that radiologists just don't follow it. They, they're still not using it because it's easier for them to just make a decision, okay, it looks suspicious, send it to biopsy, rather than you know, looking at five categories, assessing features, then summing up points, uh, assigning to risk levels, and so on. It's just like too time consuming for them. Uh, so they just like stick to their old standards. And so regarding our system, um, we, we try to fit it in this Tyrat system. So we try to develop the, a system that's replacing only radiologists in the laborious part, in assessing kind of probability of malignancy. Uh, so they're doing it based on Tyrat systems and the point system, and instead we just wanted to develop a system that returns a score for malignancy, and then everything else is kind of borrowed from the Tyrat system, uh, meaning we stratify nodules into risk levels and then make the same decisions as radiologists would. And uh, this was done to maintain like a clinically relevant decision uh, because uh, in this part you also take nodule size into account. So for example, radiologists uh, never biopsy nodules that are over one centimeter, under one centimeter, uh, and other stuff like that. And so the main part, so our data set, I don't know if you can uh, see this clearly, but so it's like, a, it's one image, but it contains two images in two orthogonal planes of a thyroid nodule. So uh, when you first look at uh, thyroid ultrasound images, you don't see much, but after looking for a few days at them, you just start noticing similar patterns and structures, and you can actually uh, locate a nodule in those images. And there's also one hint that can help you uh, that we actually used, and I tell you uh, more about it later, but there are those plus signs around nodules, and uh, they are put there by people called ultrasonographers, so people who actually take the picture, and then they put those marks to measure the nodules. So here you have like a added box and those markers, and they, those measurements correspond to those markers. And so you can uh, actually detect the nodule by just detecting those, but, but by looking at those calipers. Um, sometimes they actually, the, the ultrasonographers may make mistakes, but it doesn't happen often, so it's a fairly reliable method. And so as you can notice, we had fairly small data set, even for like medical imaging standards. Uh, for each nodule, we had two ultrasound images, so we had like two and a half thousand images, uh, and then we did something called temporal train test split. Uh, so it's often done in medical machine learning applications. Mm, there are also other methods, but if you have a temporal train test split, it means that the re range of dates for your training cases and test cases is separate. Meaning you first uh, collect training cases, you stop collecting them, and then you start collecting test cases. So um, it's done this way because for many good medical journals, you cannot call your test set a test set otherwise. They let you call it only a validation set if you have a standard randomized split. You need to have either temporal train test split or 
cases from a different institution or something like that to call it a real test set. Uh, and so in our test set, we had fairly small number of nodules, only uh, 99 from 91 patients. And then we had annotations for them. We had two kinds of annotations. Uh, so the first one was biopsy or surgery proven label for malignancy. And so what's important about this, uh, this label is that first it's nodule level, so it applies to two images of a nodule. And second is that it does not come from the images. So you cannot know this label, even like the most skilled radiologists, they cannot uh, tell you this label based on images only. This label comes from tissue sample. Uh, so that's like the first thing. You cannot be 100% accurate in this task. And then we had second set of annotations, and those were purely visual annotations, and it was um, assignment of features in five Tyrats categories. So we basically, uh, so we did it to evaluate radiologists according to the system that they're supposed to follow. Mm. But there's one problem with those labels is they are actually subjective. So for training cases, we had labels from one reader, and for our test cases, we had, uh, in addition, three expert readers, and we assigned labels based on their expert, based on expert consensus, meaning we took majority vote of three experts. And it means that we could have uh, experts who disagree on the label, because it's subjective, because let's say you have a label, is the nodule bright, slightly bright, slightly dark, or dark? I mean, it's subjective whether you say that it's slightly dark or dark, right? Um, and then we also had uh, labels from eight non-expert readers. Um, we call them non-experts, but they are still radiologists, but simply with less years of experience. And here's the overview of our system. So the first part is uh, extraction of region of interest. It's basically detecting a nodule. As I mentioned before, it's a fairly simple part. We're doing it based on detecting calipers and then extracting region around them. Uh, and then there is, uh, I'd say, the main part, predic prediction of malignancy. And then final, finally, we stratify a uh, nodule into risk levels, meaning the same levels that are in Tyrod's system. And later, we just uh, take a management decision following the, the system. And so, first part, pretty straightforward. We took faster RCNN to detect calipers, and then we take a rectangle enclosing. Um, them, and this is our region of interest. Uh, we're doing some post-processing to remove false positives because we know that there are at most four calipers. Um, actually, you can also use other detection method. We use faster RCNN, but uh, later on I, I tried to do it with uh, single stage detectors, and it also worked as well. It's a fairly simple task. Those are always like pluses or crosses. Uh, and actually, I annotated the data set for training uh, by myself by just uh, like clicking on those uh, markers. And then it's very easy to, to train a network. Uh, so just a simple task. Mm. And then the main part, network for predicting malignancy. So we used something called multitask learning and a few things to notice here. So we used, uh, we trained our network for the main task with prediction of malignancy 
and then we added prediction of features in five uh, Tyros categories. And so what you can notice is that it's a fairly small model, not even fairly, it's a very small model for deep learning standards. Small and simple, I'd say. So input is of very low resolution, uh, and also we have uh, only a few convolutional layers with very small number of, um, of filters and also fairly small uh, shared representation. Um, so just for completeness, all hy hyperparameters were tuned with tenfold cross-validation on the training set. And um, maybe one thing uh, worth noting is that we used focal loss uh, for imbalanced data set um, summed over all tasks as our objective function. Uh, so this is because we had something called imbalanced data set. It's very common in um, medical data sets. And the problem was that we had imbalance across all tasks. And so usually what you can, if you have one task, what you can do, you can simply oversample cases from a minority class to have a balanced batch or like a balanced data set. But if, if you have multiple tasks and you oversample cases for one task, then you may increase imbalance for other tasks. Um, so, so you cannot use this method. I mean, you can to some extent, but it's not as straightforward as when you're using it for, uh, with one task. So we used focal loss. Um, I'm not gonna talk uh, in detail about this, this function, but it was first applied in object detection, but uh, it was applied for object detection task, but in a classification module, so it's a uh, loss function used in classification. So that's all about this, I guess. And so the last part is stratification into risk levels. Uh, so we basically had to uh, come up with thresholds for a score of our network to divide nodules into you know, benign category, suspicious, very suspicious, and so on. So we took um, risk levels computed on the training set based on uh, assignment of radiologists. So here's uh, just like a plot to help me explain that. So here we have a cumulative distribution function of Tyrat's risk levels. And so uh, to compute our thresholds, we first take a percentile of a specific risk level. Let's say uh, Tyrat's tree, it's probably mildly suspicious. And we see that it's, uh, there are 42% of cases in our training set that have this risk level or lower. And so then we took predictions on, on the training cases from our model, and then we asked for score for percentile, in this case for uh, fourth second percentile, based on network predictions. And that was our score for this risk level. And we did it for all risk levels, and that's how we got our thresholds, so that when we took uh, predictions uh, from our network and applied those thresholds, then our cumulative distribution function of our risk levels was the same. Okay. Uh, so now, quickly results. This is on the training set. Uh, this result is not that important because, um, as I told you, we optimized hyperparameters based on the training set. So it can be slightly biased, but we uh, were close to a single radiologist, 0.8 to 
point seventy eight. Um, yeah, so that's uh, and for deep learning, it was based on tenfold cross validation. And here is on uh, on our test set. Uh, so blue line correspond to the same reader that annotated training ca cases. And uh, the first thing that you can note is that on the training set, uh, this reader got 0.8 AUC, and on the test set, it got 0.91. Um, so it means that uh, basically our test set was slightly easier. Um, but it doesn't mean anything, uh, kind of that results are biased or, or anything. Um, and also, like the, the difference between our system and the same reader is similar, so we, from this we inferred that uh, we didn't overfit, that we had like a pretty good generalization to this set uh, as compared to this reader. Um, and another thing is that we, it looks like we're doing slightly better than non-expert readers, and we're very close to expert readers. And now, uh, sensitivity specificity plot. Uh, so this can be slightly confusing, confusing because uh, usually if you go from arrow seekers to sensitivity specificity analysis, you just pick points on the curve. But here, since we take nodule sizes into account, those points are slightly off from the curves because let's say that you have a nodule that is half a centimeter large and you have, let's say, perfect prediction for it, meaning you predict 100% malignancy for this nodule, it's not going to be biopsied anyway because it's too small, because radiologists biopsy only nodules that are one centimeter or larger. So that's why uh, those sensitivity specificity points are off the curves on the previous plot. But the most important point is that we're performing at the level of expert radiologists on this, uh, on this test set, and that's like the I'd say the most important slide of, uh, for, for, from this presentation. And now, uh, about limitations. So the major limitation is that we had very small test set with only 15 positive cases. And uh, because of that, we were not able to show uh, statistically significant results with uh, p-values lower than uh, 0.05 for most of our comparisons to uh, radiologists. Mm, and maybe just to mention, this is a very common thing in medical applications of uh, machine learning that they require you to compute p-values and perform, perform uh, statistical significance tests uh, I think in other uh, application areas or in machine learning itself, you usually report results, let's say accuracy, uh, your accuracy is 90% and you compare it to a model with accuracy 0.89 and you claim that you're superior to, uh, to the previous model, uh, but you're not performing any statistical significance tests, so uh, that's something uncommon in other application areas. But uh, it's required in medical applications for some reason. Mm. One more point is that we had cases only from one institution. This was a data set uh, that we got from our collaborators, and all cases were from one institution. We didn't add cases from other institutions, and the reason why uh, a system may perform worse on cases from other institutions is that different institutions can have different data collection protocol and they may use different scanners. And so um, it applies not only to uh, like ultrasound scanners but also other types of scanners is that they add, they always add 
different providers at different post-processing to images that you see because uh, all those medical devices use some kind of a physics and then they display your results, uh, but um, actually um, those providers uh, strive to provide like clean results and remove noise and so on, so they have different post-processing results and um, on like a statistical level, the distribution of your data also applies to images, may be very different if you use um, images from different devices or institutions. And the last part, it's also very common to um, many medical imaging, not only imaging, to many medical applications is that we only had biopsied cases in our data set. Uh, so think about it this way. Cases in our data set had biopsy or surgery proven labels for malignancy, right? Uh, so it means that there is a whole bunch of cases that radiologists decided not to biopsy. So basically, they uh, sent to biopsy less than half percent of the cases. But there is like over 50% of the cases that they didn't send to biopsy. And those cases were not included in our data set, both training and test. And they were not included because we didn't have biopsy proven labels for them. And this is because radiologists could be wrong. They could decide, let's not send this patient to biopsy because it's obvious that this nodule is benign, uh, but it actually could be malignant. So we, and you cannot know that unless you biopsy this nodule. But once you biopsy it, it's a biopsy case. So it means that it was suspicious. So there is a way around it. And so you can change, uh, you can include those cases by saying, okay, if a radiologist decided that uh, object a lesion is clearly benign and a patient was followed up, let's say, three times every year, so you may be fairly sure that you have a correct label for this patient based on that. Um, but it so it gives you some confidence, but you still cannot be sure. Uh, but we also didn't have cases like that. Uh, and the reason is that it's very difficult to collect, collect cases like that. It's very time consuming. You basically have to, you basically have to look at uh, each patient and then track uh, his or her history in uh, in like medical systems and check that this patient was followed up for like every year for three years and then there was no change in finding and that you can be fairly sure. So first, there are not many patients like that uh, because also patients change institutions. They can have a follow-up study somewhere else and then you lose this patient this way and then it's very time consuming and costly to collect cases like that. Okay, and now uh, something about negative findings. Uh, so now maybe question to you. Uh, when you have uh, an application task in computer vision and you have a very small data set, what's the first thing that you try? Anyone? Yeah, we did with augmentation, but like a more general method. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's very obvious. You're using data from somewhere else, like, right? It's, uh, everyone knows that there are like low level visual features that are shared across other tasks. So you can, there are very different ways of uh, incorporating transfer learning. You can do fine tuning, something called deep features, which is actually a special case of fine tuning. Um, 
you have so many models, different sizes, trained on different data sets. You can freeze some layers. You can adjust learning rate per layer, and so on. And we, we tried all that. And we got some results, but they were far, far from radiologists. Uh, so I think this shows that. So when I first saw this problem and got this data set, I thought, easy task. Transfer learning, not so many cases. I do. I take a ResNet, trained on ImageNet, fine tune, trying freezing some layers, maybe do deep features, take SVM, train it, and I'm done. Uh, but it didn't work in this case. Uh, I suspect what could go wrong. Maybe like, you know, uh, distribution of data in ultrasound images. They have like lots of noise. Actually, ultrasound images have uh, something called speckle noise. It's like a combination of Gaussian and salt and pepper noise, meaning you have just like noisy spots that you don't know whether there are true objects or is it just a noise. And also, radiologists have trouble with that. Uh, so that could be the reason why it didn't work. Um, also, usually pre-trained models come, uh, are fairly large. So as you notice, I used a model with just eight filters in the first layer. Uh, and usually with pre-trained models, you have much, much more hyperparameters. Even if you freeze uh, most of the model, you still uh, end up with a fairly large model. Uh, yeah, so that was the uh, first thing. Another approach common in medical imaging, but also in uh, other application areas, when you have, let's say, for like a, I, I think in um, recognizing, let's say, products, when you have like, you know, objects and you have multiple pictures of the same objects from different perspectives. And we had, we actually had very, um, very good case for that because all our uh, images were taken in fixed planes. So we didn't have like, you know, different perspectives every time for each object. They were two fixed perspective um, and two fixed perspective always. We always had two images. Uh, we didn't have a situation that we had missing images or something. So we tried doing multi-view learning, and it's basically, um, so I forgot to mention earlier, we had two images, and two, uh, but we generated our predictions per nodule, per object. So we did simple averaging. So we trained our model per image, and then the final decision at inference time was just average, simple average from two images. Uh, but you can input two images at the same time, then have a part of the network processing two images separately. Then you can combine those features together and then uh, you can have another part of a network that's processing features from two images combined and then uh, return your uh, score. And so you can have only one layer that's processing two images. You can have entire network processing two images or anything in between, right? Uh, so we tried that, but again, uh, it didn't work. Uh, and the reason uh, could be that you kind of uh, reduce your data set size. So if we had two images for each case, here you kind of, ha kind of have like half of your data set. And to some extent you don't, but from like a loss function perspective, you do. I'm not sure if you... Yeah, that it's, it's not that obvious because it's not uh, that binary that you lose half of your data set because you're using them, but you kind of do. 
And now the last thing. So we thought, okay, we need to take a very different approach. So maybe instead of predicting malignancy label, we can mimic what radiologists are doing. Because we have those features, so we have labels for features. So even though they're subjective, we can try to predict features and then apply the Tyrat system to you know, uh, make a management decision. And as you can see, we're very close to our final solution. We try to, uh, so the first approach, let's predict all features one by one, but then it's like a computational expensive, so maybe it's quicker to train just one model with like a large portion of the network shared, and then having a head for each task. And we, we try that, and it turned out that you need to be very good at predicting those features to have a good score for sending nodules to, to biopsy for predicting malignancy. So we were slightly off, we were slightly worse than radiologists, and then this kind of propagated to prediction of malignancy, <coughs> that was uh, much worse. But we thought, okay, we have this, let's add one more task for malignancy and check how it's doing, and it was doing very well. We're at the level of radiologists, and the reason, uh, kind of like a ad hoc, uh, ad hoc conclusion was that uh, those tasks basically helped regularizing the shared representation so that our network no longer was uh, remembering training cases because we had issues with overfitting. That's why we use this data augmentation, dropout, very small network. Uh, so in addition, those tasks helped regularizing this shared representation so that it was relevant not only to this task, but also to all other tasks that we also knew are somehow connected to our main tasks because all those features radiologists are using to, to uh, make their uh, decision regarding probability of malignancy and then send knowledge to biopsy. And that's basically all. Thank you so much. And, uh,